Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament, chapter 13, verses 22 through 34. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, We ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourself thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, go tell that fox I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. This is God's word. Good morning. Thanks for joining us online and here at Axelrad, where I can feel it. Can you? Just a tiny little sprinkle. But we have cover back there and some cover back there. We just started last week a new series for the season of Lent, these Sundays leading up to Easter, called Journey with Jesus, taking its cue from the middle section uh, in the book of Luke that is framed by this notion that Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem and he's not going to allow anything to interfere with him getting to that place. It's about his journey and he's invited us along with him and this is a heavily didactic section. It is very theologically thick. Jesus is the teacher in this traveling classroom of sorts where he's teaching us what is most important what in terms of what it means to come to know him, but even this middle section is really emphasizing what it means to follow him. This Sunday, we look at this passage that highlights for us, it features Jesus' favorite subject. We know it was his favorite subject because he talks more frequently about the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. You can use those expressions interchangeably. The New Testament does. He talked more frequently about them than any other subject. And not only was it something that he was passionate about, but I think from a practical standpoint, he understood that it represented a series of questions that people were interested in, not just uh, intellectual curiosity about the afterlife, but Isn't it true that the more heartache a person experiences in their life, the more you just hope that this world, with its sorrows and suffering, is not it? In this passage, Jesus resolutely affirms what a long time later, Emily Dickinson said, this world is not conclusion. So we learn in this journey with Jesus, in this passage, a lot of things about his kingdom. There's three questions, I think, specifically that it answers that we want to give our attention to. First of all, what's it like? Secondly, who gets to go there? And thirdly, how do we enter in? What's it like? Who's actually there? And how do we get in? First of all, what's it like? Here's an exercise for you this week. If you really want to win friends and influence people, then when you, when you come in contact with someone, say, tell me right now, what do you think heaven is like? 
get a whole bunch of different responses to that. But I, I find that a lot of people, what, they, what comes to mind is, you know, it's going to be this place where angels are sitting on clouds playing harps. You have to endlessly listen to sermons. You're going, oh my goodness, I think that's what it must feel like to go to the other place. I think for a lot of people, it's just this sense of, I, I just hope that what it means is there is an escape, a relief from the things that press down upon us in this life. I don't think many people would describe it, though, the way that Jesus does in this passage. <clears throat> that is, Jesus absolutely doesn't think it's this button-down, boring place. It's not merely a place that you escape to from what otherwise we describe as life. It is the place of ultimate life, and he describes it as a party. Did you notice that? He said in Luke 13, 29, um, people will come and they will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. It's actually a very robust through line in the Bible. Scholars that I read said he was probably riffing on Isaiah chapter 25, Isaiah says this, on this mountain, he imagines the afterlife as a mountain. You get to summit this mountain, and on that mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines, delicious food, world-class, cellar-aged, top-shelf wine. Definitely not boring. Definitely a feast that really resembles a party. And so why are they celebrating? Why so much over the top joy? The kingdom of God is a place that Isaiah goes on to describe in this same passage in chapter 25, where God will swallow up death forever. He will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from the earth. Now, study after study have concluded over a long period of time, number one fear people have. <clears throat> it's not, incidentally, public speaking. It's death. You know, that, they're very foreboding subject. We just like to delay thinking about it, pretend it's not going to face us. Death is the greatest fear people have. What Jesus is saying is, it's not just getting into the afterlife. It's not just getting this feast. It's that in doing so, they're going to be celebrating because I've dealt with the greatest fear people have. And it's an implicit argument from the greater to the lesser. If he can overcome death, then nothing, nothing is too difficult for him to overcome. And all the things that have caused pain in this life, therefore, will be eradicated when we get into the next life. And he even says to remove the disgrace of my people. Look, there are secret things in each of our lives that when, when you think about it, it probably triggers some uh, level of shame. And if it becomes known more popularly, then, then disgrace. And what he's saying is, while that is indicative to some degree, in the human experience in this life, it will not be in the next. We will wipe every tear from your eye. We will take care of your greatest problems on down to the most minuscule ones. And as a result of bringing everything together, you're going to celebrate as I wipe the tears from your eye. You say, well, that, that's incredible. Of course, there'd be good reason to celebrate, but not really sure what that has to do with the here and now. Good question, but you see, that's not at all the idea that Jesus had. We tend to think of life in a typically Western way, very linear, and we're living this life, we're gutting it out, and that someday we'll have relief. But that's not at all how the Bible thinks about the kingdom of God. In fact, Jesus says early on, this is in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, the very first words out of Jesus' mouth, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God is not so much out there when you travel light years away from earth, it's think of it as a different dimension of reality. 
that in Jesus coming now intersects and overlaps with our life now. It's that other world that now brings a new meaning in life to this world. And in the passage that we're looking at in Luke, uh, he talks about, you know, he talks about the feast, but then he also talks about the fox. And he's talking about the Tetrarch, Herod Antipas, kind of the governor. He's the dastardly dude. He's the dark lord of this story. And he's come to disrupt things by hunting down Jesus. He's just slaughtered Jesus' cousin, the kind of the superstar prophet of the day, John the Baptist. And now he's being told, Jesus says, don't go to Jerusalem because Herod's got it in for you. And he said, go tell that fox, that sly, cunning, destructive beast. Tell him I will, quote, this is verse 32, keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. What is, what's Jesus saying? I'm going to keep doing the things that are indicative of the presence of that world in the midst of this one. I'm bringing heavenly hope into the hurt of this life for you. And they are signs, vital signs that the kingdom has actually come. It's intersecting and overlapping. And, you know, maybe you're still saying, so what? That's what it's like there. It's what they experienced in that day. But this is what the church and our mission is all about. Our church and our mission is not to be this insular body, this, this holy club that keeps people out who aren't just like us. We're to be, in essence, a hospital for the hurting. We're to be a COVID ICU unit bringing relief, not because the relief is in us, but because the king has set his kingdom up in our souls and humbly as we serve as his envoys of everlasting hope, brokenness is made whole in this world. And as a result, it injects moments of joy in the midst of the pain of this life. And we have these little feasts and celebrations along the way. All right, so that's what it's like. What about who's there, secondly? This is really the question that provoked this whole dialogue. Someone came to Jesus, unidentified by Luke, which one commentator I read said, that's good because then it's emblematic of a universal question that people have. So, how many people really get in? Who gets in? Jesus delays answering that question. Instead, drives home, which is what is a more pressing concern personally for people. He says in verse 24, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. They're asking, okay, Jesus, how many can be saved? They're doing sort of metaphysical math, cosmic arithmetic. And he's saying, no, no you need to give attention to your own soul. This is similar to what Jesus was saying in those first words in the Gospel of Mark. The time has come. First words out of his mouth. The time has come. The kingdom of heaven has come near. See, it's like he's saying there is uh, there's this, uh, this heavenly alarm clock that has gone off and it should startle us like you might be when you're in the middle of a dead sleep. He's saying, wake up from your spiritual slumber and make every effort. That word in Greek is most commonly used to describe athletic contests or warfare. He's saying you've got to be a very sober mind. You've got to be focused and intense. There's nothing passive about this. Wake up from your spiritual slumber and fight for this, because the door is narrow. And you say, well, yeah, we're returning to that. I haven't really been able to listen to what you said there because I was just sort of stunned by the phrase that the door is narrow. Um, what are we supposed to make about that? Well, it is something, of course, that's problematic, particularly for modern people. You don't like the idea of something being narrow, can't stand perhaps religion that is exclusivistic, 
It's only for the, you know, the few people. And what about all these other good people that are left? I don't really think that's what Jesus is saying here. But from the standpoint, just the logic of the narrowness, we, th- we constantly are dealing with life where we want things to be narrow. Do you see this last week where, it's terrible, I don't mean to laugh, but this uh, plane leaving Denver just lost one of its engines. Somehow the pilot was competent enough to navigate them back safely. But, you know, when you get on this little silver tube that flies in the sky, oh my goodness, I mean, you, you want there to be a very narrow process of engineering and proofing and ensuring that it is secure enough to trust your life so that it can save you as you fly through the sky. Or maybe more pertinent, vaccine rollout of COVID. I mean, don't we want that whole process to be incredibly narrow where you've had the most brilliant minds, you've had along the way, checks and balances to ensure that the integrity of it is safeguarded so that it can save us. It just wouldn't be okay to have any old person in a laboratory constructing a vaccine. We wouldn't take it, of course. And similarly, if you're talking about your eternal destiny, if you're talking about something that's going to make the brokenness in your life and in this world whole, Of course you'd want it to be narrow so that it is that which can save you and give you confidence that it'll do so. But, you know, it's also important from the standpoint of where Jesus goes next. He, um, He says something that is probably the most metaphysically chilling part of the passage. They're saying, hey there, could you please open the door He's having a hypothetical conversation. You're knocking at the door, and he says, I don't know you, comes the reply. And they they say, oh, wait, this is verse 26. We ate with you and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. Hey, we hung out, Jesus. But you will reply, I don't know you. Jesus will. Have you ever had one of those experiences where you're out in public, and there's someone that you... You kind of see at a distance and you're like, oh, I know that person. I don't know them, but I, I kind of like to know them. They seem, you kind of admire them. And you look up to your astonishment and they're waving at you. Something similar happened to me earlier today in the service. I saw someone waving and now they're waving at me. So I waved back, but they were actually just raising their hand, praising in the service. <clears throat> but, you know, this person is waving at you and you're like, oh, wow, that's incredible. But you can tell as they get closer to you, you kind of awkwardly recoil your wave because they just blow right past you. Turns out they were waving to someone behind you. You thought they knew you, they don't know you. And that is this like fear, I think, that a lot of people have. I've been a pastor for roughly 30 years. I've come to the conclusion that passages like this really need to be leaned into by some people, but not others. Some of you hear this and it's like a lightning bolt of doubt that just stabs you in your soul. And it causes you to spiral psychologically, psycho-spiritually down. Oh my goodness, maybe I'm not really a Christian. Maybe I'm, Jesus said this, it's possible to know him. I thought I knew him, but I didn't know him. Listen, based on my experience, this is my pastoral opinion. If you really wrestle with that, you don't need to worry about wrestling with it, most likely. The people that need for this to be an alarm bell and wake up are not really thinking about that. And and it's also important to know the historical context here, as it always is when you're trying to interpret what the Bible is saying. You, You interpret it in context. What's the context here? It was widespread, the scholars say, that the assumption, if you were a member of the ethnic nation of Israel, that of course your elite ethnic pedigree in that day was your ticket to get into the kingdom of God. There was a presumption there 
There was also, if you start to tease that out, sort of a spiritual pride and even prejudice there, an ethnic prejudice. I, um, it made me think of, as today's the last day of Black History Month, um, how it's just, it's always been kind of sobering and horrifying to me how in the antebellum period in our country, there were not a few white ministers, sad to say many white Presbyterian pastors, who used their pulpit to try and persuade people that God was on the side of the slave master, that, that chattel slavery was biblical. To the great shame of the church that ceased to be this representative of the kingdom of God on earth in that critical moment when they should have been standing and articulating about the way in which the gospel liberates us. The very first sermon Jesus ever delivered, he quoted from Isaiah and said, I have come to set the captive free. It's heart and soul of Jesus' mission. If you really get the gospel, that's where it'll be. But that was a form of spiritual racism. It was similar. I'm not saying it's the same thing to what was going on here that Jesus is addressing. And he's saying, don't go there. There, it, this, the, Getting in has nothing to do with your religious or ethnic pedigree. It has nothing to do with how good of a person or bad of a person you may think you are. I think it's similar to how some people today assume just that because you've, quote, grown up in the church, that you're a Christian, that you've got your ticket in to paradise. Jesus here is saying, don't, don't be so fast to assume that. He goes on to say, yes, all the big shots of the Old Testament will be there. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, Luke 13, 28, but see, what he's really saying to us is, don't assume that simply because you're the same ethnic or religious stock by tradition that you're going to get in. God, as my mentor in seminary said one day in class, that just always kind of stuck with me, God has children. He does not have grandchildren. The point here, see, that we're supposed to glean from this is that everyone who enters the kingdom enters through their personal faith in Jesus Christ. So don't delude, don't delude yourself, he's saying. So it is narrow. Don't wait. Don't delay. That door will eventually shut. But once you get in, you're going to be shocked. You may be shocked on the other side of the door, but once you get in, you're going to be shocked. Why? Because of all the people that are there. Now he's answering the question he initially asked. It's going to be flooded with people. He said um, that people will be coming. Oh, my goodness, I don't have it in front of me. I can't believe I don't have it in front of me. So I'm going to paraphrase it. He said people will be coming from the east and the west and the north and the south from all across the globe. And because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are there from all throughout time. It's similar, this ocean of people, to what Isaiah said back in Isaiah 25. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich foods for all peoples. Not just one ethnic group. This is 700 years before Jesus. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth absolutely suggesting that the Gentiles were going to be coming in. And that's what Jesus radically is proposing. He's not talking about the narrowness of all those that will end up in heaven, but how expansive it is. But you've got to go through the narrow door. Jesus is that door. So let's go there finally. We talked about what it's like, who's there. It's narrow, but it's incredibly expansive. How do we enter in? There's two aspects to this. We enter in by receiving and redirecting. First of all, by receiving. You get a clue from the words of Jesus at the end of this passage. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
You will kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were, and you were not willing. Now, why is he picking on Jerusalem? Jerusalem represented in that culture, in that part of the world, the, the cultural center. It also represented the prototype of what Jesus was calling the church to be, to be that city, as he said in the Sermon on the Mount, that is on a hill that brings light to the world. It's, it was meant to be that prototype, but they were constantly not receiving the messengers that God sent to them. Instead of receiving them and welcoming them, and, and this is hyperbolic language here, it's not to say there was no exceptions to this, but generally speaking, they, instead of receiving humbly the message of God's messengers, the prophets, they cast them out. A good example, this is tradition, not, is not in the scriptures. Isaiah, that we've been talking a lot about today, tradition is during the reign of the wicked king Manasseh, that he captured Isaiah and killed him in Jerusalem. Do you know how? By sawing him in half. Yikes. It's indicative of this place that was supposed to be the city on a hill, the, the colony of the kingdom of heaven. But instead of responding to the alarm clock through the prophets that came, they slaughtered them. And now Jesus, the ultimate prophet, the prophet who was the king, would face by his own determination that same fate. How do we change that pattern of Jerusalem? It's back to those opening words of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. The time is at hand. Heavenly alarm clock. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. What do we do? Repent and believe the good news. Repent literally means change your mind. Change your mind because then it changes, has the capacity to change your entire being. Change your mind about who Jesus is, the good news, that he is God's ultimate messenger, God in human flesh who has come to rescue us. And the best news of that good news is that he would go on this journey all the way to the cross Jesus said earlier in this passage that his goal was to head to Jerusalem, to do this. And that word for goal there means complete. He had to complete his mission. What did Jesus say on the cross, his last words? It is finished. I have finished. I have completed the goal, my mission, to take the burden of your sin and the brokenness of the world and make it whole by bringing my kingdom. So have you said, I'm finished. I'm finished with spirit, spiritual lethargy. You're waking up to the alarm clock that's sounding. Have you said you're finished by, with placing your confidence in anything other than the good news of what Jesus has done for you? You're finished taking for granted the great gift of God's love to you in Jesus. And why not? That love is the greatest thing in any world, this one or the next. And by daily, experientially entering in, we redirect our desires. We're almost through, but there's an interesting thing that scholar Joel Green pointed out in his analysis of this passage. It has to do with the word want. Luke uses it repeatedly in this passage. Did you notice that? Herod wants to kill Jesus. Jesus wanted to restore and shelter the people of Jerusalem. The people of Jerusalem have not wanted him to do so. He's saying our desires, that's where the real battle lies. This kingdom within us, where, where we have set up our own rule, fueled by our wants and desires that tend to control us more than Jesus. He's saying what it means to follow Jesus is that we are taking that good news of Jesus and we are moment by moment repenting and believing that good news so that we are curating holy desires for him, that we might love the Lord our God with everything that makes us up as individuals. Entering in to his kingdom, not just once, 
coming to faith in Christ, but moment by moment entering in through repentance and faith in him. And that's when we begin in the moments of sorrow and shame in this life to experience the joy, to experience the feast in the moments where we might feel malnourished or starving. It's entering in. It's what we're doing right now. It is that foretaste in this moment, even what we'll do in a moment in taking communion of that great banquet and party in his kingdom that will be populated by people from all across time and all across the world. The Bible ends by describing this, this party in heaven. You are worthy because, with, because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. And what have you done? You've made them to be a kingdom. You've made them to be a place of healing and hope in the midst of the world that desperately needs that. And on that day, when we enter in fully into that kingdom, we will sing the words that we're about to sing in a few minutes. We will feast in the house of Zion. We will sing with our hearts restored. He has done great things. We will say together, we will feast and weep no more. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for giving to us in Christ not only a ticket that we can punch into eternity, but a moment-by-moment realization of that hope, that joy, that feasting of your kingdom, the future imported into the now, not because we're privileged in one way or another, but because we've been humbled by your grace and we receive and redirect our desires toward that great hope in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.